Ancient and Modern Britons, Chapter 4, Book by David McRitchie. This chapter will discuss the following, The Pursuit of Diamud and Gren, Hebridean Cave Dwellers, The Kew Wearers, The Habits of the Marsh Dwellers, The Cuthacks of Ireland, The Manners of 14th Century Dublin, and Survivors of the 19th Century UK. An Early War Cry the native men and immigrants, a blending of races, in the savages, wild men or woodmen of heraldry, sometimes represented as white men, sometimes as black, are almost always naked, with the exception of a wreath round the head and another round the loins, that they became part of the cognizance of certain families in token of conquests over real savages is indisputable, one notable example being that of an ancestor of the present Duke of Athole, who received his supporters and other more substantial honours for defeating the army of a lord of the isles. The Picts, it is known, went naked, regarding the tattooed skin itself, with its representation of the totem of the owner's clan and sept, as more honourable than clothing. So, at any rate, they appeared in war, though it seems that, like the ancient Hungarians and other branches of the Agrian people, they at other times wore the skins of animals. But, as the term is conventionally understood, they were naked savages. The wild Irishmen, or black Irishmen, presumably of the same race, were the same. Those, says Strabo, that nowadays make a survey of the different countries of the world find nothing to relate of any country beyond Ireland, which lies to the north and near Britain and is inhabited by men entirely wild. There may be some doubt as to the Island here, Mint, but whether it is Ireland or Scotland, the remarks just made apply equally well. Ireland had its Cruthnai as Scotland had its Picts, so also had England and half of Europe, as already stated, but one must narrow the limits in order to follow the discussion rightly. If Father Innes meant that Ireland was inhabited solely by men entirely wild, he was, I fancy, mistaken. There is too much evi dense to the contrary to admit of such a belief. But the existence of a race of wild people is told by the Irish legends themselves. Fionn, the firm chief of the fine, blue-eyed, golden-haired, marble-skinned, whose knightly attributes were dwelt on in the preceding chapter, had, as many people know, as the chiefest of his followers, the equally heroic Diermaid. And in one of the many legends regarding them, one which bears a striking resemblance to the Arthurian romance, the figure of one of these wild men appears for an instant upon the stage. The story of the pursuit of Diarmaid and Gran, although so familiar to Celtic scholars, is yet not so widely known as to render it necessary to apologise for sketching it here. They are known as the Venus and Adonis of Gaelic mythology, and many are the versions of the story of their flight. Mr. Campbell characterises it as one phase of a myth which pervades half the world, and so it is. But underneath its mythological surface, there are unmistakable traces of incidents in the lives of real people, which took place once upon a time. How long ago, or in what locality, one can only surmise. It seems pretty certain, however, that the north of Ireland and western and perhaps central Scotland formed the theatre in which the scenes were enacted, and, about the third century, is regarded as the era. Graina, who is perplexingly styled at one time the wisest as well as the handsomest of women, and at another as she who never took a step aright, was the daughter of Carmeg of Steeds, the king of the fifth of Ullin, the hero Fion, chief of the Fain who had vowed not to marry any lady but the one who could answer all his enigmatical questions, found that lady in her, and wedded her. But their honeymoon was brief, for after the great wedding feast which lasted seven days and seven nights, and at which were gathered all the nobles and great gentles of the Fina, there was made the feast for the hounds, and over it, as dogs will, they fell out. Some of questions and their answers are well worth repeating. What is sharper than a sword? The reproach of a foe. What is swifter than the wind? A woman's thought between two men. What deed is the best of deeds? 
a high deed and low conceit. What is softer than down? The palm on the cheek. What is whiter than the snow? There is the truth. What is blacker than the raven? There is death. Among those who parted them was Diomed. Now Diomed, handsome enough otherwise, bore on his forehead a love spot which no woman could look upon and remain heart whole. He, knowing this and being a gentleman, used to hide the mark with his cap. But on this fatal day, his exertions in driving out the hounds displaced the cap, and Gren looked, saw, and was lost. She does not appear to have beaten about the bush, or indeed to have been troubled with any qualms of conscience. She frankly told him of the state of affairs, and unhesitatingly concluded with, Thou shalt run away with me. His answer was emphatic. Will not do that, said Diomede, and on her insisting further, he spoke with even greater distinctness. Will not go with thee, I will not take thee in softness, and I will not take thee in hardness. I will not take thee without, and I will not take thee within. I will not take thee on horseback, and I will not take thee on foot, said he. And he went away in displeasure, and he went to a place apart, and he put up a house there, and he took his dwelling in it. But Grain wasn't going to be baffled so easily, and one morning, soon after this, Diomede heard her voice at his doorway, crying, Art thou within, Diomede? He, to silence her once for all, reminded her of what he had previously said, repeating the words again for the sake of emphasis, but her ladyship had been too sharp for him. She was between the two sides of the door on a buck goat. Am not without. I am not within. I am not on foot. And I am not on a horse. And thou must go with me, said she. Mr. Campbell compares this incident with a similar one in the German story of Die Kluge Bauern, Doctor. Diomed evidently realised that he would have no peace here, and besides, that Fion would soon be on the track of his runaway wife, and not likely in a humour for listening to an explanation from her apparent partner in guilt. So he started off again, Greine following. They travelled on and on, this better Lancelot and more shameless Guinevere, and never rested till they reached Cantire, in Scotland, so one account says, where Diomed decided to take up his abode. The very place is named Careg and Daim in Keantir, a cavern by the seashore. Here, as on the journey, Diomed kept his pursuer at arm's length, dutifully supplying her, however, with a share of the spoils of his hunting and fishing. The various versions differ a good deal as to the incidents and localities at this portion of the tale but they agree in bringing up on the stage another victim of Grainne's wayward fancy. This was a Siudach. Mr. Campbell informs us that the word is pronounced Kewak, and that the people so named are described in the Long Island as naked wild men living in caves. He adds that the word is supposed to be derived from Siuth, long hair behind. Which word is applied in Islay to a pigtail? French, Q. He appears to have wandered by the way of the cave, or Weem, in which Diamed and, much to his vexation, Grane were living, and to have been entertained by them at first in a friendly way. For it is stated they played with him at wedges, or dice. How long the savage dwelt with or near them is not specified, but it was probably not more than a few days after his arrival that Grane, having wearied of her fruitless, one-sided attachment for Diarmaid, and having wholly transferred her affections to the newcomer, who fully sympathised with her views, arranged that her second love should slaughter the first, now become highly inconvenient. There was a sudden deadly struggle, and then Diarmaid, flinging off his assailant, sent his spear home into his naked bosom. Of the subsequent events of their history, of their discovery by Fion and his men, and of the way in which Fion, believing Diar made guilty, brought about his death, it is not necessary here to speak. There is a vein of pathos running through the thing, for Fion was loath to lose his favourite warrior, or to be himself the cause of his death, but he steeled his heart against him. There is a striking scene, sketched by Mr. Campbell, of the last moments of the hero, Fion took sorrow for him when he fell. What would make thee better, dear maid? 
if I could get a draught of water from the palms of Fion, I would be better. These are the words of the narrator, the translator adds. I will remember to have heard how Fion held his palms to Diarmaid filled with water from a spring which is still shown, and how a draught from the hollow palms would have healed the dying warrior. But Fion thought on Graine and opened his hands and let the water drain away, as he held his hands to Diarmaid's mouth, and Diarmaid died. And then, when it was too late, Fion learned his grievous error, for, when Diarmaid gave out the shout of death, the chief, turning to his faithless wife, asked bitterly, Is that the hardest shriek to thy mind that thou hast ever heard? And she answered him, It is not, but the shriek of the Kutach, when Diarmaid killed him. Here then we have a glimpse of those men entirely wild, of whom Strabo wrote, and tradition makes them out to be cave dwellers. It does more. It calls them by a name which signifies the wearer of a queue. Now, however different such men may have been from the courtly gentlemen who sported pigtails in this country a century ago, it must be remembered that this mode of dressing the hair is a distinctly mongoloid custom, practiced today by Chinese, North American Indians, and the tribes of Northern Asia and Europe. I do not stamp this man as a queue wearer, simply because of the Islay rendering of Chiuth, although the traditional meaning seems deserving of all respect, and the word itself is likely akin to Q. But in another version of the story, in which he is less romantically styled a great sprawling old man, he is called by the narrator Tiofach Mac Agoil. This word Tiofach will be admitted by anyone who knows Gaelic, as identical with Geobag or Geophag, a gypsy. I take this word from Armstrong, and it may be mentioned here that all the Gaelic words introduced throughout this book will be found in one or other of these three dictionaries, Armstrong's MacLeod and Pawars, and MacAlpine's. These again are virtually the same as Siav, a side lock of hair, a ringlet, Kayabhak, hairy, bushy, having much hair, having ringlets, and Kayabhagach, hairy, bushy, having much hair, having ringlets, and Tiabhagak, bushy having, curls, ringlets, locks, or whiskers. Goil again, which is the genitive singular and nominative plural of Gael, a foreigner, means also a hanging lip, a shapeless mouth, an angry or sullen look, a blubber cheek, while goilich derived from it signifies sulky, blubber lipped or cheeked, having a swollen or distorted face, and goil car, goil and fear, a man, is a blubber lipped person so that this wearer of a queue is also known as the one with the ringlets or locks, a scion of the blubber-lipped foreigner. This inelegant adjective, about which I shall have more to say in another place, is a very important one, for it describes exactly the remarkably coarse and flexible lips ascribed by Professor Huxley to the ancient Egyptians, from whom gypsies or geophags claim to be descended as do also some Scottish races, according to tradition, to the natives of the Deccan and to the Australians, all of whom he states to be of the same stock as the maternal ancestors of the Melanocrui of the British Islands. The connection between bushy hair and ringlets would seem to indicate something like the luxuriant and carefully curled hair of the ancient Egyptian statues, but the pigtail, it was said, seemed to figure a mongoloid and not an Australoid. I do not pretend to do more than suggest, and since both races have inhabited these islands, there is some excuse for supposing that they mingled. At any rate, the wearing of the hair in long plaits, sometimes in a single queue hanging down the back, as among the Chinese, sometimes in two tails, one on either side of the face, as among the American Indians and the Siberian Chukches, is one of the oldest known fashions in this country. In the meantime, let us look more at the willness of those tribes, chiefly as shown in their want of clothing or their habit of not regarding clothing of any kind as a necessity, to put it otherwise. The heraldic savages and the historical Picts wore little or none. The historian Buchanan quotes this further information from the description of Solonus. It, Ireland is inhospitable on account of the cruel customs of its inhabitants. The natives are savage and warlike. 
After battle, the victors stain their faces with the blood of their slaughtered enemies. They make no distinction between right and wrong. Those who study elegance ornament the hilts of their swords with the teeth of sea calves, which they polish as white as ivory. For the principal glory of the men consists in the brilliance of their armour. And from Herodian, he quotes, plus. In the first place, however, he, Severus, took care to cover the marshes with bridges, that his soldiers might stand securely and fight on solid ground, for many places in Britain are rendered swampy by the frequent inundations of the ocean, and through these marshes the barbarians themselves swim or wade, sunk to the bellies in mud and frequently naked, regardless of the slime, for they are ignorant of the use of clothes, but encircle their belly and neck with iron, thinking this an ornament and a proof of riches, in the same manner as gold is with other barbarians. Besides, they mark their bodies with various pictures and the forms of a variety of animals, on which account they do not clothe themselves, lest they should cover the painting of their bodies. But they are a most warlike race and rejoice in slaughter. Their arms consist of a narrow shield and lance, with a sword hanging by their naked bodies. They are almost entirely unacquainted with the use of a coat of mail or a helmet, thinking these impediments in passing through the marshes always covered with vapours and dark with exhalations, the blubber described by Pythias. These sketches are the presentment of what in all con science is a savage people. The Meate or marsh folk against whom Severus fought were Caledoni, nicknamed Picti, known as Moors or black men, of the race of Damnoni who had curly hair, which may mean Chiabagakli, and swarthy skins which they tattooed with their family totems, they wore nothing except their weapons like Zulus or any other dark-skinned savages. They smeared their faces with the blood of their foes. If they, the Damnoni, were not cannibals, their nearest neighbours were. Is not the whole picture one of the most utter savagery? It is interesting to notice how long some of the habits, recorded by Herodian, have survived. Scott, in a note appended to Rokeby regarding the lines, hiding his face lest foemen spy the sparkle of his swarthy eye, gives the following anecdote. After one of the recent battles in which the Irish rebels were defeated, one of their most active leaders was found in a bog, in which he was immersed up to the shoulders, while his head was concealed by an impending ledge of turf. Being detected and seized, notwithstanding his precaution, he became solicitous to know how his retreat had been discovered. I caught, answered the Sutherland Highlander by whom he was taken, the sparkle of your eye. Here, therefore, is an example of the ancestral mode of warfare or an incidental feature of it, practised fifteen hundred years after Severus. And the dress of Scott's rebel may also have been the same as that of his remote ancestor, excepting the ornaments. Spencer talks of the naked rebels, and the only article of clothing he allows them is a mantle or plaid, which seems to have resembled the blanket of an Indian more than anything else, and while useful for sleeping in or for wearing in ordinary circumstances, must necessarily have been cast aside as an encombrance during an engagement, leaving the warrior absolutely nude. But the descriptions in the Rokeby notes are so interesting and so illustrative of this subject that it may perhaps be allowable to make several considerable extracts from them. The next picture is of the time of Queen Elizabeth, and it portrays the carne, or commonalty, of at least one district of Ireland, about that period. The following quaint verses are quoted by Scott from Derrick's image of Ireland. With writhed glibbers like wicked sprits, with visage rough and stern, with skulls upon their poales instead of civil capes, with spicares in hand and swords besides, to bear off after clappers, with jactics long and large which shroud simplicity, those spitful darts which they do bear importer iniquity. Their shirties be very strange, not reaching past the thick. With pleats on pleats they pleated are as thick as pleaters may lie, whose sleeves hang trailing down almost unto the shoe, and with a mantle commonly the Irish carne do go. Now some amongst the rest did a use another weed, a coat I mean of strange devis, which fancy first did breed. 
His skirts be very short, with pleats set thick about, and Irish trousers mow to put their strange protactors out. Scott adds, Some curious wooden engravings accompany this poem, from which it would seem that the ancient Irish dress was, the bonnet excepted, very similar to that of the Scottish Highlanders. The want of a covering on the head was supplied by the mode of plaiting and arranging the hair, which was called the glib. These glibs, according to Spencer, were fit marks for a thief, since when he wished to disguise himself, he could either cut it off entirely, or so pull it over his eyes as to render it very hard to recognise him. This, however, is nothing to the reprobation with which the same poet regards that favourite part of the Irish dress, the mantle. It is a fit house for an outlaw, a meat bed for a rebel, and an apt cloak for a thief. First, the outlaw being for his many crimes and villainies banished from the towns and houses of honest men, and wandering in waste places far from danger of law macth his mantle his house, and under it covereth himself from the wrath of heaven, from the offence of the earth, and from the sight of men. Probably one of the figures in a woodcut reproduced in the West Highland Tales on volume 4, page 373, representing the Irishman who fought in the German army during the Thirty Years' War, gives the same fashion of wearing the plaid as that referred to by Sir Walter Scott. This man has apparently nothing but his plaid, which is wrapped round him, and a bonnet covering his head. When it raineth, it is his penthouse. When it bloweth, it is his tent. When it freezeth, it is his tabernacle. In summer he can wear it loose, in winter he can wrap it close. At all times he can use it, never heavy, never cumbersome. Likewise for a rebel it is as serviceable, for in his war that he maketh, if at least it deserve the name of war, when he still flieth from his foe, and lurketh in the thicky woods and straight passages, waiting for advantages, it is his bed, yea, and almost his household stuff, for the wood is his house against all weathers, and his mantle is his couch to sleep in. Therein he wrappeth himself round and coucheth himself strongly against the gnats, which, in that country, do more annoy the naked rebels while they keep the woods, and do more sharply wound them than all their enemies' swords or spears, which can seldom come nigh them. Yea, and oftentimes their mantle serveth them when they are near her driven being wrapped about their left arm instead of a target, for it is hard to cut thorough with a sword. Besides, it is light to bear, light to throw away, and being, as they commonly are, naked, it is to them all in all. Lastly, for a thief, it is so handsome as it may seem it was first invented for him, for under it he may cleanly convey any fit pillage that cometh handsomely in his way. And when he goeth abroad in the night in freebooting, it is his best and surest friend. For lying, as they often do, two or three nights together are abroad to watch for their booty. With that they can prettily shroud themselves under a bush or bankside, till they may conveniently do their errand. And when all is over, he can in his mantle pass through any town or company, being close hooded over his head as he useth, from knowledge of any to whom he is endangered. Besides this, he or any man else that is disposed to mischief or villainy may, under his mantle, go privily armed without suspicion of any, carry his headpiece, his skein or pistol, if he please, to be always in readiness. Spencer's view of the state of Ireland appered works ut supra vae. 367. Their seruantes and varlets at another bineth them, whereof by Seming they were displeased and beheld each other and Walder not eater, and cider, how I Walder take fro them their good usage, wherein they had been nourished. Then I answered them, smealing, to appease them, that it was not honourable for their estates to do as they died before, and that they must leave it, and use the custom of England, and that it was the king's pleasure they should so do, and how he was charged so to order them. When they hard that, they suffered it, because they had put themselves under the obeisance of the king of England, and pursued in the same as long as I was with them. Yet they had one use which I knew was well used in their kunta, and that was, they died were no breshes, I caused breshes of linen cloth to be made for them. While I was with them I caused them to lose many rude thingies, 
as well in clothing as in other causes. Mochia dough I had at the first to cause them to wear gowns of silker, furred with manure and grey, for before these kinges thought themselves well apparelled one they had on a manticle. They rode always without saddles and styropes, and with great pain I made them to ride after our usage. Lord Bernays, Froissart, Londe, 1812, Forte, Volour Tande, Pours, 621. What can one compare this with, but such a scene as is every now and then enacted, when a British officer or governor gives lessons in deportment of the modern British order to a conquered Zulu king or a Maori chief? Those Irish monarchs of four or five centuries back differed in no essential degree from the kind of men now called savage and uncivilised. They rode their horses barebacked, themselves in a like condition, like the wildest Indians on the plains. They had so little respect for clothing that they D-Day were no breeches, and thought themselves well apparelled when they had on a mantel. These are facts. It may well be disputed whether multiplicity of garments signifies increased refinement, or whether those naked men of five hundred years ago had not as high a conception of honour, bravery, and brotherly love as many a muffled-up specimen of modern humanity. They certainly could not have had among them any men of coarser calibre than a modern British rough. If such differences mark civilization and savagery, those men were savages. But so far as Sir Richard Surrey's evidence goes, this particular tribe or race was a vast improvement on some of those which preceded it. At any rate, their fashions were those of what, rightly or wrongly, we call uncivilised people, whatever their natures were. It may be that even their predecessors of a thousand years before were not so savage altogether as some of the chroniclers make out. An enemy doesn't see the amiable side of one's character, and if they did some very fierce things, perhaps they did nothing much more barbarous than the blowing away of helpless captives from the cannon's mouth. And even the Irish of Solinus, who made no distinction between right and wrong, might be matched in the present century without going very far from home. However, these are points which may be decided according to preference. The fact remains that, in outward seeming, all of the races glanced at in this chapter were savages. And it may be remarked before leaving Ireland that distinct traces of this savage and mongoloid element exist in that island today, not only visible in deeds of bloodshed and cowardly murder, but also in less serious acts. I make a few extracts from the newspapers, chronicling incidents of a kind with which we have been lately too familiar. Cork, Monday. Another fatal affray has occurred in the south. A large party of men, disguised and armed, visited several farmers' houses in the district of Phyrus and Farrenfor, near Tralee, on Sunday morning, and compelled the men to swear that they would pay no rents until Parnell was liberated. In some instances, they assaulted the owners of the houses and cut off their whiskers. The police state that they traced the raiders to Reardon's house, heard them cry out, Boo! And, seeing a flash of light, though they heard no report of firearms, they discharged two volleys. Farther particulars respecting the arrest of Connell have been received here. Among the documents found in his possession is one containing a list of intended outrages on a number of persons whose names with their punishments are given. One man for paying rent to be shot, another for a less aggravated offence to have his ears cut off, a young woman for having spoken to a policeman was to have her hair cut to the bone, another account giving the particulars of the examination of the meeting Moonlight Raiders states, the evidence showed that on the night of the 7th December, the house of Mrs Fitzgerald, at the foot of Mushroom Mountain, was broken into by a number of armed men. Mrs Fitzgerald was struck with a gun, and an attempt was made to cut the hair off the head of one of her daughters. A man named McCarthy, a labourer, had his moustache cut off. The informer stated that, on the night of the outrage, 7th December, the party met at the Two Higgs house. There were eleven persons altogether. The two prisoners were there. There were over a dozen hats in which were holes for plumes, and they had foxes' tails for whiskers. Another order read as follows. 
Regimental order by Captain Moonlight for appointed raids on 30th of 12th, 188 Ra James Sullivan to be shot in legs, and his mother and daughter clipped for dealing with the Hegartys. John Lineham, storytelling, to be clipped, etc., etc. These extracts are the records of an outburst of utter barbarism, and it is difficult to believe that the events took place within the British islands in the year 1881. It is quite apparent that to the perpetrators of these acts, the cutting off of the hair meant an extreme degradation, and seemed to them as serious a deed, however puerile and grotesque in our eyes, as shooting a man in the legs. Mr. J. F. Campbell refers to the same idea when he says of a certain Gaelic phrase that it is explained to mean clipping the hair and beard off one side of the head, and that the punishment was probably inflicted at some period for the phrase occurs several times in Gaelic tales. The motive is identical with that which made the Huns shave their heads as a sign of abasement at the death of their king, and which makes the Chinaman resent so deeply the cutting off of his queue. And it marks a race connection most distinctly. The holes for plumes cut in the hats of the raiders is another clear survival, and must date at least as far back as the naked horsemen of Richard II's time and the schoolies man instead of civil capes, described by Derrick, and the cry of boo, which the police knew as a sign of battle, is yet another evidence, traceable farther back than the others, but all are equally stamped with the mark of a great antiquity. For this word boo, or bow, which survives in the larger island as a sound of terror to children, and also as an accompaniment of a row among noisy crowds, is really an ancient war cry. It is usually spelt bu in the Gaelic dictionaries and usually defined a sound to excite fear in children or some such phrase, but its original meaning is clearly seen where under the form abu, which would be more correct if written abu, the a being a mere preliminary breathing. It is stated to have been the war cry of the ancient Irish. The words cromabu it has been pointed out to me since the above was written, form the motto attached to the armorial bearings of the Dukes of Leinster. The latter half of this legend his obligations of maintenance in return, 1592-1595. This note runs as follows. In all the instances which have come under the editor's notice where native men are mentioned, it is evident that they were not, nor did they claim to be, of the blood of the individual whom they acknowledge to be their chief. They appear to have formed the bulk of the Populatean of the Highlands, and to have descended from the ancient occupants of the soil, whilst the clan, properly so called, consisted only of the blood relations of the chief. For claim originally meant children or descendants. By degrees, however, the word clan received a wider interpretation, and embraced all who fought under the banner of the chief, among whom, of course, were included all the able-bodied men dwelling on his lands, whether his kinsmen or his native men. In general, it may be affirmed that the former were the higher class, or aristocracy, and the latter the commonalty of a clan, the exceptions to this rule being very rare. The Maccoles and several other smaller septs were native men to the stewards of Appin, and the propor tion they bore to the stewards proper will be seen from the following abstract of a return of the killed and wounded of the Appin Regiment in the campaign of 1745-6. to six. The number of Stuarts proper given in the lists amounts to 22 killed and 25 wounded. The various commoners fighting under them were of killed 69 and of wounded 40. Consequently, the greater part of the Appin Regiment was made up of men of a totally different race from that of the chief and his kindred. The commoners in this list come under one or other of these names. Mackle, McLaren, Carmichael, McCombick, McIntyre, McKinnish, McElduey, Mackenzie, McCorkadill, McCushkader, Henderson, McCranken, McCannanick, Cameron, MacDonald, McLachlan, McClear, and MacArthur. With regard to the first of these, the editor remarks, so intimate was the connection between the Stuarts and the Mac Coles that no single chieftain of the family of Auchnacona reposes in his tomb without a Mac Cole having been placed on each side of him. 
With regard to the other names, several of which were at that date borne by distinct clans, themselves as honourable as the stewards of Appin, it is probable that while some were those of native men, others were borne by renegades from other clans who were perhaps not of native blood. Or they may have been all native men, though bearing the names of other clans, in which clans they had been of the commonalty. Or again their surnames may mean nothing particular in the way of pedigree. Highland genealogy is rendered dreadfully uncertain and confused by the circumstance that two men or a dozen men might bear the same surname, and yet be of wholly different descent. Any son or descendant of a Donald was MacDonald, any son of a carpenter was MacIntyre. And although these, and many other similar names, did eventually become attached to certain particular tribes, yet the existence of such a fact makes it extremely difficult to trace out a lineage with any degree of certainty, and nullifies any sweeping statement about this or that surname, in a great number of cases. However, the above testimony proves that the majority of the Highland people were subordinate to one or more invading races, whose chiefs stood to them in the relation of alien overlords at the first, but who gradually and inevitably became identified with the native people. So many Highland pedigrees have an ultra-Scottish origin that it would be useless to attempt to specify these. But we saw that a Flemish settler of the 12th century became transformed into a Highland chief, and the very stewards themselves are said by Pinkerton to have come in with the conqueror, who gave to the first of them, Allen, the Shropshire barony of Oswestry. Such people in course of time became Gaels in speech, and some of them became partly Gaelic in blood. But some, I dare say, have actually none of the Aboriginal blood in their veins. A clear case of miscegenation is that of the Macraes, whom Dr. Johnson encountered. The Macraes, as we heard afterwards in the Hebrides, were originally an indigent and subordinate clan, and having no farms nor stock, were in great numbers servants to the Maclellans, who, in the war of Charles I, took arms at the call of the heroic Montrose, and were, in one of his battles, almost all destroyed. The women that were left at home, being thus deprived of their husbands, like the Scythian ladies of old, married their servants, and the Macraes became a considerable race. Sir Walter Scott, however, in a note to Croker's Boswell, it says, in answer to Er. Johnson's ejaculatory question, what can the Macraeus tell of themselves a thousand years ago? More than the doctor would suppose. I have a copy of their family history, written by Mr. John Macra, Minister of Dingwall, in Rossshire in 1702. In this history they are averred to have come over with those Fitzgeralds now holding the name of Mackenzie, at the period of the Battle of Largs in 1263. This apparent contradiction is explainable by the assumption that the framer of the pedigree had traced it through the nobler or maternal stem, a very common weakness among family historians in such cases. The McClellans of Bombay, a family at one period of great power and influence, supposed originally to have come from Ireland, were, in ancient times, sheriffs of Galloway. Duncan McClellan is mentioned in a charter of Alexander II in 121.7. If the North Country McClellans, therefore, were of this race, this is the explanation of the thing, and I have little doubt that a further examination would prove the correctness of the hypothesis that the Galloway MacLellans were of the conquering and non-Aboriginal race is seen by the following extract from the same authority, J, an extract which is of great importance also, as tending to confirm all that has been already said with regard to the indigenous Moors of Scotland. Although the crest of the MacLellans was a Moor's head on the point of a sword, in allusion to their recovery of the estate of Bombay after being forfeited, by the slaying of a gypsy chief, who infested Galloway they sometimes used for crest a mortar piece, with the motto, Superbo Frango, etc. Here again, then, is evidence of a contest between an invading and presumably white people and a native and distinctly dark-skinned race, who are clearly regarded as Moors, and it seems only to require investigation to show that the Macrays, who were subjugated in the North Country, 
and the people who subdued them were respectively related to the corresponding races in Galloway. Indeed, the mixture in this instance of two widely separated families is indicated by Boswell in his journal, although at that date the process of amalgamation had been going on for more than a century. There was great diversity in the faces of the circle around us. Some were as black and wild in their appearance as any American savages whatever. Plainly of native or stock, one woman was as comely almost as the figure of Sappho, as we see it painted, and she, it may be inferred, was the opposite of black and wild. They were known as the Wild Mac Ras in the Chevalier's muster roll of 1715. It may be remarked here, parenthetically, that the Morley who was killed by McClellan in Galloway was probably a precursor of the Black Morrow of peasant tradition, who was perhaps one of the last of that very clan. Further, the application of the terms gypsy and moor to the same individual reminds one that Diarmaid's Kiuthak or Kiofach was compared with Giobag, a gypsy, and that the Kentish Blacktan and the Gaelic Dub Shublak, or Black Vagrant, were gypsies also. Dr. Johnson speaks also of the Macquaries of Ulva as a tribe of great antiquity, that island having been possessed by the family of the then chief. For 900 years. But this, of course, is not a long enough period to entitle them to be regarded as an Aboriginal race. The name is said to be Guari, and their descent is drawn from Guari, Gore, or Gorebred, said to have been a brother of Fingon, ancestor of the MacKinnons, and Anrius or Andrew, ancestor of the MacGregors. Plus, this last clan is also stated to be very old, if not Aboriginal, and to be of the Seol Alpine, or race of the Albanac. Probably they were hybrids. Their legendary descent is drawn from the father of Kenneth MacAlpine, King of the Picts, 844-860, either through that monarch or through a brother of his. If this could be authenticated, it would prove them to be half-breeds, for such was Kenneth, so far as can be ascertained, he being understood to be the son of a Scot by a Pictish princess through whom he derived his right to the throne, according to Pictish law. It seems, however, that he really fought his way to the throne, his father Alpin having shown him the road. For the Chronicle of Huntingdon states that in the year of his accession to the Pictish kingship, Kenneth encountered the Pict seven times in one day and having destroyed many, confirmed the kingdom to himself. And in all probability his hold on the sovereignty was maintained by the sword to the end of his days. St. Bertrand says of him, Seventeen years of warding valour, in the sovereignty of Alban, after slaughtering Krithnich Picts, after embittering Gauls, foreigners, he dies on the banks of the urn. Bid. Page. 313. So that, if the MacGregors were sprung from the race of Alpin, they were only partly Pictish, and they owed their power and position not to the native race, but to the conquering Scots, or Gaidel. It would be wearisome to search out the various so-called Aboriginal clans and to attempt to analyse their pedigrees. This, indeed, is a task which it would be utterly presumptuous for any but a scholar to undertake. But the random glances bestowed upon them have shown that the native men of a thousand years ago were, at that period and subsequently, undergoing a process of subjugation and in some districts extinction at the hands of invading Normans, Flemings, and others. I have followed Mr. Skeen so far in his belief that the early Scots and the Gales were one. It will be seen later on that there is reason for questioning the correctness of this assumption.